All right, everybody, welcome and welcome back to many of you. This is the New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital's Teaching Kitchen, and my name is Chef Emily. Most of you I seem to uh, see and know, and thank you so much for coming back from my classes. I hope that they have brought you a lot of good food, first and foremost, and a lot of inspiration for your kitchen. So thank you, everybody. And, um, and if you have been enjoying this program, uh, just a reminder to share these classes with your friends and family. Um, I know there's still a bunch of people that are stuck at home looking for different um, healthy recipes to support themselves through this extended kind of quarantine lifestyle. So please feel free to share our programs um, or, you know, if you have some emails that you'd like added to the list, I'm happy to add them to our email list. We should be sending out our April calendar, our long awaited April calendar. Um, we should be sending that out later this afternoon, so certainly stay tuned for that. We have a class this Thursday, um, which is going to be a lot of fun on, uh, it's sort of an April Fool's theme, so sneaky fruits and vegetables, so how you can get more veggies into, um, into your meals and, uh, and enjoy that too. So today's topic is Eastern European dishes. Um, just a few Zoom ground rules before I jump in. So uh, please remain muted throughout the presentation. And then if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box. And we have our wonderful volunteer moderator, Alita, who is going to be reading us your questions throughout the program. So certainly feel free to interject your questions in the chat box at any time, and we can get to those um, as quickly as possible. So thank you, everyone. Um, so with that, the Eastern European region is quite large. So uh, I wanted to focus on a particular cuisine that I feel is really not very well known, but is really delicious. Uh, and that's Georgian food. So I don't know if any of you out there have had Georgian food before, show of hands, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> um, so it's a really, really tasty cuisine. It includes a lot of walnuts, I found out as I was researching this program. Um, I love it. There's a restaurant that, um, that I used to go to down by Brighton Beach in the city, and, um, and they make fantastic Georgian food. One of the dishes that they're most no well known for is there, I guess the loose English translation, is it called a cheese boat? It's basically like an, a long oval doughy, um, you know, doughy bread filled with cheese and egg. It's very, very, very filling. Not the healthiest, but very filling. Um, so we picked out some of the healthy things that I really like from that menu. They make a fantastic garlic chicken. So we're gonna be making that today. We're also going to be making a spinach and walnut dip. I think it's, um, I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce these because I will not do them justice, but you have the original names in your packets if you are feeling like um, embarking on a tongue twister. And then the third recipe we're making is a beet pate. So these are nice because they can be chilled and stored. And, you know, it's a nice way to add tons of spinach and beets into your diet. Um, which we know are very good for us. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. So those are going to be our three recipes for today. Um, any questions before we jump in, Alita? Anybody got anything for us so far? Not yet, Chef Emily. Oh, wait a okay. minute. I'm sorry, something just came yeah. up. Is Perfect. That, um, what a coincidence you mentioned walnuts in this cuisine because just yesterday I went to walnuts.org and saw some really <laughs> interesting recipes. That was yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, awesome. Um, so you can do a lot with walnuts. A lot of people sort of think of them as a sweeter nut to be used in desserts, but there's definitely a savory application for these nuts. So I'm excited to share that with you. So I'm just going to start off by heating my cast iron skillet and getting that nice and hot before we get our chicken in there. So this is the chicken that we have today. It's these chicken legs, and they are room temperature, skin on, bone in. Um, and I salted them with a little bit, uh, well, I, I added a little seasoning, salt and pepper. Um, the advantage of working with meat that's room temperature, if you pull something out of the refrigerator and you then put that cold item and expose it to heat, 
the outside will get hot, but the inside is still going to stay kind of cold, which means that often we tend to overcook our chicken, which is how it ends up dry. So that is, I think, the secret to not overcooking your chicken is pulling it out two hours before you cook it so that it can get to room temperature so that it all cooks um, evenly. And you don't have that inside portion that's still cold when the outside is, you know, kind of cooked and done. So that's important. Um, this recipe calls for lots of garlic, as the recipe, um, the name suggests, garlic chicken. A jalapeno pepper. Jalapenos are not very spicy. I think I, I don't think of myself as um, someone that likes spice, but I still can tolerate a jalapeno. Uh, and then we're going to use a little bit of butter in this, uh, in the skillet to saute this with a mixture of oil. So we're mixing both um, two tablespoons of grapeseed oil and two tablespoons of butter. The original recipes call for all butter, but we're trying to make things a little bit healthier here. So we'll like get our two tablespoons of butter in. And then we'll get our two tablespoons of grapeseed or you can use avocado in. So we're mixing these basically to minimize the amount of butter, minimize the fun. <laughs> so just turn that, kind of get that melted down. Um, and that's kind of everything that's going in here. So I also have some whole milk mixed with water. And then our sauce is very, very simple. It's just the whole milk mixed with water and you have the um, proportions in your packet. The garlic, 10 cloves, so these are peeled, and I just cleaned the tails off. And then the jalapeno is going in as well. Um, there's a little pinch of salt that I added too. That's pretty much it for the sauce. So we're gonna start by kind of browning this chicken, and then we're gonna take it out. We're going to let it rest for, uh, well, actually, because we already did this step, we don't have to take it out. We can just get the sauce right in there. Forget that. We're going to get our chicken in the pan, get it nice and brown, skin side down. Okay. And you just wanna make sure, I think there should be enough space for these guys. So the butter is kind of stopped foaming, so it's nice and hot. And we can start to put these in. You want a nice sizzle when your chicken hits the pan. That's the goal. So I have four pieces here that you could do, you know, more or less, depending on how many people you're serving there. You would just make more or less sauce, depending on that as well. All right, let's get rid of that chicken bowl because we don't want to cross contaminate. And we're just going to let that sit and simmer and sear. All right. So as that's working over there, just gonna make sure that the flame is directly under the pan. Sometimes the flame tends to come out from under the pan if it's a big flame. Um, and what that does is it, it, it disperses the heat. So instead of going directly under the pan and really heating up the pan, it kind of goes out and it doesn't actually end up heating the pan so much, even though it's a bigger flame. So let's get rid of these gloves. And we're just going to, actually, I put those on for a reason. <laughs> I knew I'd put those on for a reason because we're going to work with a jalapeno and I don't want the, um, the jalapeno to get in my eyes. So put your gloves on or just make sure that you wash your hands really, really well. I feel bad now. I just threw out a pair of gloves for no reason. Oh, well. All right. So there we go. We're taking off the top and we're going to slice right down the middle. And jalapenos have these little seeds in them. The seeds are the spiciest part most peppers actually the seeds are really the spiciest part so just keep that in mind um i use the tip of my knife to kind of trim out this vein actually a little bit easier with a smaller knife because you have some more control but my smaller knife is i think in the dishwasher so we're going to work with the big knife so just peeling that vein out and the seeds nice and clean and just keep in mind when you are working with these jalapenos you know, because we're working with something that's so small, we tend to kind of want to get closer to it. It, it can have some juice that kind of like pops, you know, you can kind of hit a juice membrane and um, just keep your distance. Let's just put it that way. Keep your distance. All right. So there's a jalapeno. 
Our chicken is smelling really good. I'm just gonna get rid of the seeds so none of them sneak into our sauce. And let's just help the blender along here by cutting this a little bit smaller. And then we're gonna pop this into our blender and blend it all together. Any questions, Alita? Just checking in with our audience there. Yes, sir, Emily, there are a couple. So question right. number one is, can non-dairy milk be used? So the traditional way to make this recipe includes, you know, obviously includes the milk with the, the dairy version. Um, let me think about that for a second. I'm trying to think, it would definitely change the flavor if you use the non-dairy milk. The kind of um, milk I would suggest using is maybe cashew milk, because that's really nice and thick, kind of like whole milk. You could probably do this with a cashew milk. I wouldn't recommend almond milk because that's too thin. Soy milk is too thin. So you could do a thick cashew milk. Um, and you could even, if you were feeling ambitious, you could make the cashew milk yourself. Um, get some raw cashews and soak them and blend them all together and, uh, and use that instead. I think that cashews would work well. I'm not sure about any other nuts or seeds, though. Good question. Yeah. Um, an additional question here is, this is about the spinach dip. I know you, you're not there yet, but okay. Marianne wanted to know if you can use almonds rather than the walnuts. Walnuts. You can use parsley for cilantro. Okay. So Marianne, thank you for your question. Thank you for watching. So we're about to get to that recipe. The spinach dip, the cilantro really does give it a special flavor. Uh, but if you really don't like cilantro, I think you could make that substitution for parsley. The parsley is going to be a lot kind of grassier and maybe not as bright and lemony. So you may want to squeeze a little lemon juice in there if you're if you're making that substitution. Um, and then the other substitution she was thinking about was instead of the walnuts, using almonds. So walnuts are a lot juicier, I want to say. Uh, they're a lot juicier of a nut than almonds, which tend to be a little bit drier. I think a good substitution would be pine nut, but those are very expensive. Um, but a pine nut would work well. You could probably do almonds. If you were going to do almonds, almonds though, I would get the slivered almonds, which are skinless. They, they have the skin peeled off of them. Um, you'll see it labeled as a slivered almond. You could probably play around with that. I think that that variety of almond might work okay. All and right. Chef yeah. Emily, um, Paula is stating that there's a Georgian restaurant in Mount Kisco called Baji, B Bajoni. I'm not sure how to yeah. pronounce it. Um, and yeah. she said they have your bread dish, I guess is a dish <laughs> on the menu. She hasn't tried yeah, it. Yeah, I could. It's real. It's very good. It's it, it like comes in the shape of a boat, and um, it's kind of like like a thick pizza crust all the way around. And then the inside is the cheese, and they put it a raw uh, egg yolk, and then um, often they'll come to your table and scramble the egg in with the cheese um, as it's still really hot. So it's really it's it's, been a, it's a full experience. Um, I haven't tried to make that myself. I've looked at recipes, but it's definitely a few days of a process. So uh, I, I just want to opt for things that are a little bit easier, you know, to get into. So definitely, um, yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. All right, so our chicken's looking good. Um, we browned it for about five minutes or so on both sides. Now, I just want to turn your attention, the fourth note here says transfer to a plate. That's if you haven't, you know, we just made our sauce as this was cooking. So you don't have to transfer it to a plate. We can just pour the sauce right over and then we're going to, you know, toss it right into the oven. So the oven has been preheated. Um, it should be pretty hot now. Yep. Let's just read our thermometer. Okay, perfect. So um, it should be at 400 degrees. And I always recommend for people to buy an internal oven thermometer. They're not very expensive. You can usually get them in a hardware store. Um, they, you know, they kind of go, they go inside the oven and they tell you the actual temperature because some of these dials just aren't that good when it comes, if you need like an exact temperature, especially if you're baking and stuff like that. So it's a worthy investment. 
Okay, I think I just saw a question pop pop up there. I just want to check in. Yes. So, um, Chef Emily, should other meats also sit at room temp two hours before cooking? Yeah. So generally, with meats, it's um, it's best to try to get things room temperature before you cook them. Ideally, yeah. Okay. And the next one is: Can you use the seeds and cook them in the pan? The seeds of what? The uh, jalapeno. I guess so. It doesn't specify. Um, Barbara, did you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, she says yes. The pepper. The okay. <laughs> sure. I mean, Barbara, if you want to use the seeds, you can definitely use them. I find um, a lot of people find that they're very difficult to digest. Um, so I, I kind of leave them out for that reason and they tend to be very, very spicy. So that's another reason I leave them out. So I would say that's up to you, your digestion and your level of spice tolerance. <laughs> so I remembered why I said to take this chicken out of the pan now, because this is really, really hot and we're going to be adding this to it, which is going to sizzle this milk sauce. And I just didn't want it to, um, be kind of difficult to manage with the sauce and the chicken. So that's why I, I suggested taking the chicken out so that you could kind of get the sauce in there, stir it with the butter, and then pop the chicken back in. I've forgotten about that. It's like, why did I do that? Sometimes I make these recipes and then I write them down and um, it's been, a, so it's been a while since I made this one. <laughs> All right. So we're just gonna make sure that the chicken, so the chicken has a nice sear everywhere now. It's um, really nicely browned all around. And we're of course working with our cast iron skillet. Um, you can see I just flipped these over so that they could um, absorb some of that sauce there. And now we're gonna turn this off and this whole pan goes into the oven. You know what, it's a little heavy, so I'm just gonna be extra careful. All right, and pop this in here. Okay, any questions about that? Um, no questions, but there was a, a comment from Valerie. She says that adding oil to butter when cooking also prevents the butter from browning. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and she says she believes that that's also healthier. Yeah, so uh, Valerie, thank you for that comment. You're right, when you add oil and uh, to butter, Butter browns at a different temperature than oil smokes, so it does help to keep it from, from browning. And in this particular instance, that is a good thing. Um, we didn't want to brown our butter today, so thank you. Um, so a quick trick, which is when you're cooking uh, chicken or any kind of meat and it splatters a lot, now there's some little oil particles on the floor. So you can take some salt, and this is going to not be so fun to vacuum later, but at least you can throw some salt down on the ground, right? So you don't slip and um, you have a little bit of grip under your footing. This is how we do it in the, uh, in the restaurants because <laughs> there's often oil everywhere on the floor. So there's a lot of salt <laughs> down on the floor as well. Any questions before we turn to our next recipe, the spinach dip? No questions, Chef Emily. Okay, perfect. So I'm just gonna pull our food processor over because this is gonna be the star of our show. And um, I honestly don't know how they ever made anything without food processors because all of the Georgian recipes that I've worked with seem to use a food processor. If you didn't have one, certainly you could, you know, chop up your spinach really, really small or you could um, kind of grind up your nuts using a mortar and pestle. And they probably used mortar and pestles before you know, before all of that. So uh, before all of this. So certainly it can be done, but we live in, a, in an era of ease and convenience. So we're going to use the S blade on our food processor and work on our spinach, um, our spinach dip first. So I have all of our ingredients, mise en place here. We've got our Walnuts, you know, these are raw walnuts, not toasted, not salted, completely raw. We have our cilantro, or if, uh, if you're using parsley out there, you would use parsley. I'm just gonna take the stems off with a big whack, pop those off. We can put those in our compost. So we're left with mostly leaves, which is what we want. 
We've got three cloves of garlic, again, peeled and trimmed. Um, a little bit of vinegar, so you can use, um, you can use white wine vinegar, or I think I also mentioned white balsamic. Yes, yeah, so either of those would work fine. So we have our vinegar and we have some walnut oil as well. So those are the main ingredients here. And then of course, our spinach. So um, I got a big, this is where you have to use your imagination, big pot of water boiling. I took two containers of spinach. I'll show you how, let me show you how big they were too. Right, so it was, these are 16 ounces. So it was two of these that went in and I boiled them in the water and, uh, and then I drained them. So I drained them really, really well. Um, I'll show you this little contraption I came up with over here. This is really helpful if you wanna press liquid out of something. So we have our cooked and drained spinach here in our colander. I set that in a larger bowl. Uh, you wanna make sure that the colander is lifted up off the bottom of the bowl, otherwise it's just gonna be sitting in its own liquid. And then I took a pot, filled it with water and set it on top to press it. So this is pretty heavy and this was acting as a weight. Nothing else. All right, any questions about that process? No questions, but there was a comment about um, the knife that you use for the jalapeno. Um, does it yeah. have? Mm -hmm. Does Would it you, have what? Sorry. Does it, does it have like I guess the essence of the jalapeno on it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Up the essence. It? Yeah. So I used uh, my chef's knife for the jalapeno. So certainly I can even see like a little jalapeno juice on there still. So there's still some jalapeno happening on that knife, which is okay. It's not a big deal. We're gonna be okay with it. It's not too much heat. No, no. So here's our spinach from those two containers. And if you want to, by hand, you can just press out a little bit more of that liquid. I'm kind of using the side of the bowl braced against my body to squeeze. There's still more liquid in here. Can you believe this is what came out of those two giant boxes? So when it says 32 ounces and you think, oh my gosh, that's a ton of spinach, look what it cooks down to, not more than two handfuls. Really, really almost nothing, especially once you drain it. So some people are a fan of drinking this spinach juice. It's not my preferred way of um, obtaining vitamins and minerals. <laughs> I prefer to just eat the spinach or, you know, if you wanted to, you could throw this in the soup, certainly. Um, but yeah, it's not my, wouldn't be my choice to drink it. But if you enjoy that and you want some added iron and calcium and minerals and all that stuff, uh, be my guest. I mean, if you feel, um, if you're feeling inspired by it, absolutely. It's completely potable, potable spinach juice. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to gather up a few last leaves. Okay. And that's it. This is going to go into our food processor. Let's pop our other ingredients in here. We have our walnuts. About a cup and a half. Let's get this going first. Give this a few pulses. Beautiful. Let's add our garlic, about three cloves. And then we've got our cilantro. Pop that in. This is gonna give it that really bright, beautiful lemony flavor. We're gonna add our vinegar in here too, why not? Our vinegar, our walnut oil, it's all going in. Um, and if you wanted to add some salt, this would be a good time to do it. All right, let's get something to scrape that down. Cause you do wanna kind of allow the food processor to work with everything. So Georgia includes many different climates, um, which produces many different fruits and vegetables. So that's a pretty cool thing about Georgia um, is you can really get a whole range of different things. Um, tropical fruits are grown, for example, around the Black Sea, 
the mountainous regions have also have um, other, you know, other foods that grow in the mountainous regions. And then there are pastures and uh, regions where they produce a lot of wine. So they have a lot of different kinds of um, kinds of climates in all of that mountain and pasture and um, and seaside that uh, that really help to produce different foods. So this is our bright green spinach dip. And at this point you can taste it and think, okay, is this, you know, is this bright enough? Do I want more vinegar? Do I want more oil? Do I want more salt? So that's really up to you to play around with. I'm just gonna show you what it looks like in our bowl here. So you can chill this, you can chill this mixture, and then you can shape it into balls. So it's, it's still a bit um, soft right now, but you can, after you chill it for a while, you can kind of shape it into balls and have it as a little appetizer. So think about all the spinach that you get, you get to eat with this recipe. I mean, it's really packed, packed, packed with nutrients. Any questions, Alita? Yes, um, Chef Emily. So the recipe calls for 32 ounces of fresh spinach. How yes. much frozen spinach would you be, would the Good question. I've never made this with the frozen spinach. I've only used the fresh, but um, I would say, I mean, you guys saw it ended up being, you know, two large handfuls. So I would say like three to four cups of frozen spinach. Yeah, good question. The fresh, you know, obviously the fresh gives it a very fresh taste. Um, Here's our spinach. I'm going to chill this and then we'll take it out a little bit later. Okay, any other questions before we go to our next recipe? Another dip spread thing. I think um, I'm not too sure why these are so big in Georgia, but they are a great way to get vegetables in. So I'm all for it. So there's a question about what, what is fenugreek and what does it taste like? Okay, yeah. So this recipe traditionally calls for fenugreek. Um, it's a spice that we find a lot in Indian cuisine specifically. And um, it kind of tastes like, it has like a little bit of a, an earthy taste to it. And oh gosh, it's really quite unique. I'm... I'm not too sure how to describe actually the flavor of fenugreek. Has anyone in the audience had fenugreek that can help me out in, uh, in describing the flavor of it? Because it's so unique. It's hard to kind of put words to it. Like there's an earthiness, there's a nuttiness. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if those descriptors are helpful, but, um, but it's very good for you. So it's, if you can find it, it's a great thing to to use. It's just a little bit hard to find sometimes, which is why we didn't use it today. So Chef Emily, you know me and my research, right? So yes, please. That um, they are um, used a lot in Indian cooking with a sweet, nutty flavor reminiscent of maple, yeah. maple syrup and burnt sugar. Oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have characterized it that way. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that's interesting. Yeah. It's, okay. It's bitter, right. it's bitter when eaten raw. Yeah, exactly. It's like a little bit bitter, a little bit nutty. Um, I guess it does have like little notes of caramel in there, mm -hmm. but they're very faint in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Alita. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna jump to our next recipe, which is our beet uh, pate, another beautiful recipe that I can't pronounce the name of. Um, so beets, uh, you want to roast these ahead of time, or you could steam them, whichever you prefer. I steamed these because I already had a pot of boil boiling water, so it was just quick and easy to do it that way. Um, and then after you've steamed them, you just want to peel the skins off. So you can do this using a vegetable peeler, or you could even, you know, kind of scrape away with your hand. The vegetable peeler is pretty fast, though, so let's do it that way. So beets, of course, these are wonderful root vegetables. Very, very good for us. Um, in particular, beets are, the carbs in beetroots are mainly simple sugars, but the beets are so high in fiber that it means your body can um, digest and metabolize the sugars in the beets. 
um, you know, without really raising your blood sugar. So there's a lot of fiber in here. They're also a really good source of folate. So the, that B vitamin folate, um, fantastic source of folate, potassium as well. Um, and that red, red beet color, right, tells us there's a lot of iron in here too. It's a really great, um, like blood cleansing, blood building kind of food. So I'm just going to clean those peels off. Um, so the iron, there's also a little bit of vitamin C. And there is some studies suggesting that beets may help to lower blood pressure. So you know, if that's something that you're worried about, um, you could consider including more beets in your diet and see how you feel. Just beware if you are prone to kidney stones. Um, there, beets are what are called a high oxalate food. So the, in the beets and the greens as well, there's a lot of oxalates, um, which if you have issues with, um, with kidney stones can be problematic. So that's just something to think about. So these are steamed and peeled, and I'm just rubbing these up on the box grater, kind of get these shredded up. And I think I saw another question come in there, Alita. So um, to save time, can they just buy pre-cooked beets? You can, of course, you can buy pre-cooked beets if that's, um, that's going to save you time. And um, I'm getting beets all over my face today. <laughs> um, definitely you can. I think there's, as it, you know, I always say there's nothing quite like the fresh stuff. So if you have the opportunity to buy them, you don't even have to wash them. You know, you can just buy them and throw them in the steamer pot because you're going to peel them anyway. Um, and just kind of let them steam in the background as you do other things. And it's not that hard to steam beets, but certainly purchasing them is a lot easier. So <laughs> you could try that as well. So here are our grated beets. Wow, so beautiful. And I'm just gonna take my gloves off and adjust my earpiece because it pops out whenever I smile. I have to be very serious when I teach. Um, all right, we're gonna get this going here. So we're gonna start getting our walnuts ground down a bit. Then we're gonna pop in uh, some spices here. So we have cumin and coriander. So you can grind the cumin seed ahead of time or if you're using the whole cumin or you can you know, grind it yourself, um, grind it ahead of time or bind it, buy it already ground, excuse me. So either one is fine. We're gonna pop our garlic in here, more garlic. There's a lot of garlic in these dishes. I think um, there's definitely no vampires in Georgia because the amount of garlic that there is in their food is um, you know, very impressive. So we're gonna get our mixture of, we have uh, both cor um, coriander, excuse me, cilantro and parsley. Coriander is the French word for cilantro. Sometimes my brain just goes into a different language. Totally normal. Um, we're going to add a little drizzle of maple syrup, about a teaspoon. We'll add our pinch of salt here. We're going to pop some lemon juice in. So I had half a lemon that I had sliced up last week. So I'm just going to add the rest of that. Use this up first before cutting into a new one, right? Okay, and that's pretty much it. Everything just goes right into the food processor, nice and easy, right? So I don't know about you, but I love hummus, but I, I get a little tired of it from time to time, you know? So it's nice to um, just have a different option of different types of dips that you can serve, um, that you can enjoy. This will keep in the refrigerator easily, you know, for five days, five to seven days. So you can make a big bunch and enjoy it all week. I don't know if it freezes. That's the only thing I have not tried because I usually eat it all before it goes to the freezer. So let's pulse our herbs in there. We'll add the beets. Any questions? No, no questions yet. Thank you. No, is everybody just staring at, out their window, longing oh, at the sunshine? There's one now. <laughs> Could you just put the whole beets in the processor instead of grating them? Yeah, so you can't really, I tried that shortcut, um, and you just end up with like lumps and chunks of beets, so it doesn't really work that well. Um, 
you know, it's better to grate them, grate them and then add them. Because as you see, I'm just kind of pulsing this together. And she times and it's done. Is there a substitute for the beets? No. <laughs> Spinach. <laughs> Spinach is your substitute for the beets. Um, if you don't like beets, actually, I do recommend, if you don't like beets, I recommend that you try golden beets. I know that they're still beets, but um, there's a different taste, I think, to golden beets that... Uh, I, I know of people who don't like beets, but with the golden beets, they're totally fine. So maybe that's something to play around with is, um, is just having the golden beets instead. It'll look different. It'll look very different, but um, it could be something to experiment with. Beets are very good for you. I, I have to say, I didn't like beets very much for a long time because I had only really had like canned beets before and beets that weren't super fresh, you know, in like school cafeteria beets. <laughs> so I, I wasn't a big beet fan. Um, but as I, I really grew to love beets when I learned to roast them, um, they get really sweet and caramelized. Uh, steaming them works really well too. And, um, you know, you can dress them up with all these different flavors and it's really, really good. So, so keep an open mind about beets. Another question? No, no questions, but uh, um, Phyllis does agree that the golden beets are better. <laughs> All right, so we have a uh, someone who's a fan of the golden beets. Fantastic. I'm gonna grab my little meat thermometer here. Okay, so a, a couple other things about Georgian cuisine I wanted to mention. So they're really big wine producers. Um, and what's interesting about Georgian food um, is that the Silk Road was one of the major influences on the history of the cuisine of Georgia. So cuisine and ingredients of the East and West met in the middle of, in Georgia, and, uh, and Georgia really managed to incorporate all of these new ingredients and meals to kind of create its own um, cuisine and identity for, George, for Georgian food. So if you go to a Georgian restaurant, you don't think, oh, this is sort of Mongolian, this is sort of Chinese. It really is Georgian. It has its own characteristics and identity. So, um, so I think that's a pretty cool thing to note. All right, let's check on our chicken because it's probably been in there for a little longer than I anticipated. Smells really good here. Beautiful. All right. So this looks good. I'm noticing that um, the chicken is nicely browned. It's been sitting in this garlicky jalapeno milk sauce. And you just want to make sure with your chicken that it reaches the right temperature. So you kind of want to go into the thickest part. This thermometer is not the best. It's great if you have um, the instant meat thermometers. Those are really good. But this one's a little bit slow, so we're just going to wait and see. Um, the chicken, of course, we so we browned it, added the sauce, and then popped it in the oven for about 15 minutes. Um, chicken is very high in protein. Of course, we know all of the saturated fat is in the skin. So if you are trying to eat a little bit healthier, you can cook this, you know, sear this in the skin, um, cook it in the oven, and then, you know, peel the skin off and discard that skin so you don't eat that part. That's a way to decrease them in the saturated fat. And garlic, 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 so much 10 cloves in this. Um, the benefits of garlic, there are these wonderful sulfur compounds that are formed when garlic is chopped or crushed. Um, so garlic is um, hopefully, we think, very good for the immune system. So it's a good thing to enjoy all year round. Um, there's also, there are some studies suggesting that garlic may be helpful, again, for reducing blood pressure. I think between the beets and the garlic, I think the Georgians really have it figured out. They must have very low blood pressure. Uh, and perhaps um, garlic may even improve cholesterol levels. So perfect. So, um, so that might be another reason to enjoy your garlic as well. So our chicken went in, we roasted, we have our uh, other recipes done. I just wanna make sure we covered everything. I think we did, yep. So that meat thermometer should read 165 and it's exactly at 165, so we are golden. 
Um, I have a page in here about Georgian cuisine. If you want to learn a little bit more, um, there's a big wine culture. I mentioned that already twice, uh, but there's a little bit more you can read about um, Georgian food on the first page of your packet. And then, oh, I didn't talk about spinach and walnuts. So of course the spinach, um, we mentioned it's very high in um, vitamins A and C. I don't think we mentioned vitamin K, but it also has folic acid as well as iron and calcium. Um, spinach originated in Persia, in that region, and it belongs in the same family as amaranth, if you've ever had amaranth before. Um, it's in the same family. It's related to beets and quinoa as well. So they are all in the same botanical family. And um, again, if you are at risk for developing kidney stones, spinach is another one of those high oxalate foods. So just uh, speak to your doctor if you are planning to include tons of spinach, like in this dip, <laughs> in your diet and you're prone to kidney stones. That's something to be aware of. And then the walnuts, of course, high in antioxidants, vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids. We love walnuts and apparently Georgians do too. Um, may even have some anti-inflammatory compounds. So great for reducing inflammation in the body. Good um, fibers as well for your gut bacteria, all that good stuff. And we've got lots of herbs in here too, the cilantro, the parsley, um, a lot of great things. So any questions before we wrap up? You know, we only have about a minute to go. No questions, but the, <clears throat> a comment about the golden beets that they're also very good roasted. Yes. Oh, awesome. Agree. Agree. I'm all for golden beets. So I'm just going to show you guys, plate this chicken up, give you a closer look. And, um, and give you a closer look at the spinach as well. So this is our chicken, super flavorful. You see how it maintained that golden crust from the searing? That's, you know, that's where it's gonna get all of that flavor um, built in. All right, let's check on our spinach and then we'll be on our way. Okay, wow, that's a lot of spinach. <laughs> So at this point, let's see. So it is firming up a little bit. So at this point, you can kind of start to shape it into little spinach balls. Serve it as like a dip or a little appetizer. You can even put some more um, crushed walnuts on top if you wanted to keep on that theme. And um, same thing for our beets here. So they look, they look nice. They're a little more firm than the spinach, right? So same thing. And put even put these side by side. Look at that. So you have these beautiful, you know, iron packed, calcium packed dips. You can fold them into your hummus if you still have some hummus, or if you want to just um, spread them in a sandwich, you can do that too. Add some veggies into your sandwich or your wrap. Um, just have them as a dip, just like this. And I hope you'll give these recipes a try. We'll, um, we'll close class. It's 1.45. So Alita, I'll just check in for any final questions. Um, two really quick ones. The, the milk sure. sauce just evaporated? The milk sauce? Yes. Oh, the milk did not just evaporate. So there's still, yeah, there's definitely still some yummy sauce happening in this pan. And you would not throw this away. You would definitely um, serve this, you know, over your chicken. So here's the sauce. You can see it's got this nice, kind of beautiful greenish color. There's a lot of good flavor in there and the garlic is in there too. So definitely um, don't throw that out, serve that with your chicken. And Emily, the last question is, um, what kind of washable cutting board would you recommend? Washable cutting board. Okay, so we uh, at the hospital, we have all of our cutting boards are from a, a brand called Ecolab, E-C-O-L-A-B. And they're these um, plastic composite boards that we can throw into our dishwashers, which sanitize them. Um, so those are the ones that we use. Um, and I even bought some of these for myself at home because I really like them. Um, other plastic cutting boards that I would recommend. I mean, I think these ones are really good. These are mostly the ones that we used in culinary school too. So I guess that would be my suggestion, yeah. That's Great. it. No more, no more questions. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. If you're interested in our class on Thursday, um, stay tuned. More information is coming out. Our, our April calendar is 
coming out soon, I hope. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to come to these programs. Uh, please share them with your friends and family. And it's beautiful out today. Spring is happening, everybody. So eat your spinach, get your greens, eat your beets, go for a beautiful walk, enjoy the sunshine. And as always, thank you to Alita for moderating. Thanks, everyone. Take care. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.